Hello everyone, you're more than, more than welcome to the opening of Pink is, is My Color. Um, the exhibition features the work of 14 different artists. I'm not going to name them all, but uh, I'd like to start um, by saying that the exhibition is dedicated uh, to the memory of Dr. Flicka Small. Dr. Flicka Small passed away a couple of weeks ago and she was the inspiration for a Bloomsday uh, thematic art exhibition that I curated back in 2019 on uh, mentions of food in Ulysses. Uh, and Dr. Flicka Small was an expert on, uh, in that field. She was a chef and she specialized in food references in Ulysses. Um, so the show is really de dedicated to her. Strangely enough, uh, last week I decided to commission um, milliner uh, John Shevlin to create the hat that you can see on the plinth there. I just wanted to have a pink uh, ribbon, you know, and John came to the gallery a couple of days ago and when I asked him how much do I owe you, he said, no, it's a gift in memory of uh, Flicka. So John knew Flicka as, as well and it's funny, every time I see the hat now it reminds me of Flicka and she loves hats on top of that, so it's uh, a uh, very strange coincidence, you know, but... Uh, so anyway, you, you're more than welcome, everyone. And mm. the reason, as Alan, is the fact, obviously, as you know, Alan presents a program every Saturday, the artist well, where interviews people. And Alan is an artist, a visual artist, who specializes in, in portrait commissions. And, but the reason I asked Alan as well is that Alan participated in, in a group show that I curated last year, 1515, so he knows the process as well. Uh, at least a process with the Olivier Corne Gallery when it comes to participating in, in a thematic art exhibition. So I suppose we can start this, this conversation, Alan. Okay. Um, I'd like to start by, by congratulating um, Olivier on wearing pink. <laughs> you talk, now, I call that salmon, or <laughs> peach maybe, but uh, <laughs> so this is my effort for pink. I think my wife Trina did extremely well. In that. <laughs> the uh, shocking thing. Shocking. <laughs> she is pretty shocking. Anyway, listen, thanks very much for having me. Um, the, the subject that we're going to talk about today is, is all about thematic exhibitions and the business of curating. And, and it's an area that I must say I'm a little bit confused about because I'm not quite sure what curating means. And I think sometimes it might be used in the wrong sense. Um, whereas, you know, there's obviously a definition. So could we start maybe by asking, what is your definition? I was going to say, don't, don't get me started on the subject because the term, <laughs> oh, the term is, is overused, abused by a lot of people, I feel. Uh, I'm a gallerist, I'm an artist's agent, so my job is to host, I have the space, to host and organize art exhibitions on behalf of my artists solo art uh, exhibitions and group exhibitions. I would never, never use the term curate in the context of a solo exhibition. And I would invite artists to question that when somebody pretends they have curated their show. The reason for me, that would take agency away from the artist. Artists at the end of the day produce a body of work, a series of works, and then they contact the gallerist when they want to exhibit the work. Yes, of course, there's going to be a bit of mentoring along the way. Mm. Artists need a bit of affirmation, reassurance. Now, I'm working with the same artist for a long time. Yanni Peters, for instance, you know, I've worked with Yanni for 20 years. So I'm very familiar with her work and there's an element of trust as well. So, of course, mm. uh, when preparing a solo exhibition, the artist will check a few things with me, you know. They just want to know that they're on the, on the right track. Yes. But there's no curation on my part. At the end of the day, if there was to be curation, that would be the artist. They, they are working on the theme. Yeah, sure. So our concept. It, it, when you talk about curation, then it, it, is it really the process of choice? It's the process of first of all, I'm the instigator mm. of the exhibition. I choose the theme, and we can talk about how I choose themes. Yeah. So I have the idea of a show, and then I select the artist. Mm. You know, for instance, in the Larry the Lexicon, they asked famous people to select works of art. These people are not curators either. You know, the artists have been chosen beforehand, but they were, the person has been asked to select. So selecting 
an art exhibition is not curating. So curating is really, you're the instigator of the exhibition. Yeah. You choose the theme, the title, you choose the artist. Yes, yes. You write a brief uh, for the artist. Mm -hmm. In a solo exhibition, you know, the statement that you're going to send to the press is actually written by the artist. Again, they're talking about their practice. Uh, in a group exhibition, I'm the one who comes up with, uh, with, with the text, if you like. But is there more to than that in the sense that Hanging, in, in, in my opinion, is, is an art in itself. Mm. Um, does that very much the job of the curator? So hanging is, for me, the cherry on the cake. Mm. I've done all I've described before. The artists have produced the work. They bring the work to the gallery. For a group exhibition, I tend to do the hanging myself. I might get some help sometimes uh, in terms of the physical hang, but this one actually I hung myself, yeah. uh, aided by one of my volunteers. It's the cherry of the cake. This is when, because of I know the theme, I want to create certain dialogues. So there's a lot. I mean, I give myself three days to hang a show, but I would have spent maybe three weeks with some of those works. Yeah, you, uh, you mentioned to me once that, that the hanging of a show can make or break a show. That when, when guests arrive into a room like this and, and they get an immediate impression, uh, you know, there's a lot of background work to making that impression. And yes. it can either be disastrous or be hugely effective. Mm, for me, you know, this is something I've learned over the years. It takes three seconds for somebody walking into an exhibition space to dismiss the exhibition straight away. Um, especially in my case, I work with a very sort of eclectic bunch of artists, you know, we have figurative art, uh, we have plant portraiture, we have abstract, we have semi-abstract. When I hang a show like this one, I want to make sure that the minute people walk into the space, you know, I've caught their attention. So, and the first sort of piece that a person would see, whether you start looking at an exhibition from left or from the right, mm -hmm. that's a very cultural thing, by the way, uh, people will see the painting that I've placed there by Noel O'Callaghan. I know this is the first painting that people will see. Yes. And then, you know, I've, I've, I drive their attention to, and I've done that. If you look at the frame around Noel's painting, it's yellow, straw, straw yellow. I've actually used that, and there's actually a smooth transition to that sort of group of paintings there. You take absolutely everything mm. into, and people are not aware of that. And this is something that I think you gain over the years. Um, in a group show like this, there's color frames, which for me are a bit problematic at times. Mm. I have to work with that. I want people to forget about the frames. And so how do I work with that? You look at the brown frames there. There's a bit of brown in, in, in the next painting. That's very important for people to forget about the frames and to concentrate on the works. Yeah. And this is something that I think you gain over the years. And I pay a lot, a lot of attention uh, to things like that. So, so would, would you put abstract with abstract? Or mm. would you mix them? Or does it I depend do, on a lot of other factors? I do, and I do that all the time. Mm. If you look at the first, or the second, or the third works in the show, I've combined Yanni Peters' um, uh, uh, Red Campions with Joe Dunn's sort of abstract work. If you look at the colors, for instance, you know, uh, they actually go well together. Mm. And it's, it's a conscientious thing on my part. First of all, these are the first paintings in the show. People are going to see, oh, there's a combination of figurative art, abstract art, and semi-abstract. Mm. So already I'm giving the tone of the exhibition. Yeah. And the idea as well is that for people to see that you can actually combine abstract mm. and figurative, yeah. whether it's in an art exhibition or at home. Mm. And I've done the same with, with David Fox, beautiful abandoned boss. And again, the abstract work beside it. If you see the colors, for instance, there's a lot of commonality between the two. And again, it's the idea, it's actually okay mm. to have figurative art yeah. with abstract art. So tell me, how did you come up with the, the title, the theme for this particular one, Color, Pink is My Color? Yes, so for me to curate a thematic art exhibition, I need more than one reason to do it. Um, because if I have more than one reason to do it, I think it's gonna create a lot of interest. It's a bit of a long story, but I think it's, it's, it's an interesting story. Uh, so basically last year I worked on another thematic art exhibition that took a lot of my time, which was based on urban trees um, in Dublin. And it was an exhibition I co-curated with Paddy Woodworth. And it took a long, long time. We had constant conversations with the four artists in the show. We planted a garden outside in collaboration with Beverly Jack College. And I thought, this is an exhibition that has wings, you know? Yes, yes. And I thought to myself, mm -mm, I'm going to skip the Bloomsday exhibition this year. And I think I was right because there was a lot of interest in the exhibition. 
But as a result, I felt quite bad afterwards because I was told that my gallery is actually known mm. for its participation in the Bloomsday Festival every year. Yes. So I thought to myself, okay, I need to find something to rejoin the Bloomsday Festival next year. And in November last year, uh, the cultural attaché of the Spanish embassy came into the space and told me that the ambassador was keen on having a special exhibition as part of Gay Pride in June 2024. And I was like, what's the exhibition about? I just don't get you know, artists that I know nothing about into the gallery. And he said, it's an exhibition of erotic art. And I was like, hmm, interesting, why not? And I thought to myself, erotic art, Gay Pride, June, mm, erotic, Bloomsday, you know, Ulysses, yes. I have my show for, for next year, you know, yeah. for, you know. Yeah. And then for whatever reason, the, um, this exhibition, the artist decided to go for another space. So I think the exhibition will be shown in the Ton Gallery. I was oh, a bit, this year? Yes, All right. and I was a bit disappointed, mm -hmm. but the whole idea of, you know, um, Gay Pride, um, stayed with me and I was thinking, okay, that's, that's an idea. And one day I was outside this painting by Mary F. Fitzgerald. Now Mary has embarked on this, like she's now, you know, creating bigger paintings, you know. And I was absolutely blown away by that painting and it was actually hanging in the corridor. And I was looking at it, I thought, oh my gosh, Mary uses a lot of pink in her work, you know. And I was like, oh, interesting. I went to the storage area, I said, but Mary uses pink all the time. And I started looking at other works in the storage area. Nikki Hayden has based a solo exhibition on the color pink a few years ago. So, you know, I was like, mm, pink, you know, do I have something, you know? And I was thinking of gender discussions as well, the cliche about the pink color. That week, the Gem Joy Center had a talk about gender considerations in Ulysses. And then there's another painting that I always wanted to exhibit, um, David's, um, David's painting. So these two paintings, the amount of pink in them, that was it. I said, I have an exhibition. And it was all a matter for me to do a bit of research, you know, the pink color, the history of the pink color. Do I have an exhibition? Do I have a theme that might interest the artist, but we have very little time. Can I just select works, you know, from the storage area? Yes. Anyway, I did a bit of research. I got my interns involved and we came up with a brief, which I sent, you know, the artist, mm -hmm. thinking that they might not have the time or the energy to produce new work, but most of them actually produced new work, yeah. uh, which I was absolutely very impressed with, mm -hmm. you know? Very so good. that's how the exhibition sort of came along. There's always more than one reason. I need to have more than one reason. Yes, yeah. no, I, I'm interested in that because I think the idea of telling an artist what to do is, is kind of fraught, fraught with um, some, you know, uh, different angles that you may not want to get into. Um, and I'm just reminded that uh, of the art critic Aidan Dunn, who wrote, um, and I quote here, Olivia Corney has a knack for curating good thematic shows allowing artists to affiliate their work to a subject, in this case, climate change, without distorting their customary practices. And here he elicits thoughtful, nuanced responses from a number of fine artists. So when you do that, do you ever find any resistance from artists to say, well, no, sorry, look, that's not, that's not my idea. I did in the early days, sure, yeah. I did. And the thing was, when I started participating in the VIEW Art Fair, and this is a piece of advice I got many years from Gerald Davis. You have to do things differently, otherwise, you know, you're going to be invisible. Mm -hmm. So I was the only gallery to present a thematic art exhibition. And year on year in, I did that. And as a result, the exhibition always got a lot of attention. So Aidan Dunn actually mentioned that uh, for this uh, exhibition that I'm kind of proud of, Two Degree Census. Uh, an exhibition on, 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 on climate change, you know, and I think for this one, the artists were more than willing to, to produce new work because, yes. you know, climate change was already, that's back in 2017, people were already, artists were already really thinking about that and producing work on, on the subject, you know. Um, but it's actually funny the way that exhibition came about because people say, oh, you always find really interesting topics. These topics do not come out of the blue, uh, you know. Uh, what happened was that in 2016, I presented an exhibition at the VIEW Art Fair based on a poem by Baudelaire, Elevation. And then, you know, when I present an exhibition at the VIEW Art Fair, during the winter months, the exhibition comes to the gallery. And there I was in January 2017, and we 
were showing this exhibition based on poetry by Baudelaire and Trump had just been elected. And one of the artists, I can't remember which one, came to the gallery and said, you know what, the first thing that his team has done was to remove the reference to climate change from the website of the White House. And then I said, thank you, Trump. I have the theme of my next exhibition yes, for yes. you. And that's how it happened. Really? But at the time, some of my artists were already working on climate change. Jordi Fornis had just completed a residency. It's one of the most famous residencies in the world. It's the uh, Arctic Circle residency, where artists are invited aboard a ship circling the Arctic you know, circles. Yeah. And Jordi took photographs of the glaciers melting away and produced a fantastic body of work. So again, it's not me mm. just coming, you know, with coming up with a theme. Know. You know, I look at what my artists yeah. are at. You know. And what would you say was your most original thematic art exhibition? Now, there's a few that come to mind. Uh, one that I did <laughs> in a shop window. I think it was for the uh, 150th anniversary of of the birth of WB Yeats and I was asked to curate an art exhibition in collaboration with um, Hodges Figgis, the, the bookshop in, in yeah. Dublin. And there I was with the person in charge of placing all the books. We were basically in one of the bay windows oh, yeah. and the crowds were walking. I felt like, is it like, I felt like in the red like district kind of, you know, <laughs> people staring at you in the window and it was kind of original in that sense, you know. Yes, yes. Uh, but maybe one that I really enjoyed doing this years and years ago, I think in 2007, I was asked to ask a group of artists to respond to a play, a play by Paul Kennedy that was going to be um, played in the Focus Theatre, a real institution in Ireland, the smallest, you know, theatre in Ireland and that was interesting because I was given the actual text and had to give it to the artists. And the, the, the exhibition was about sex and there was very tricky subjects at the time anyway, I felt. And I thought, oh, I don't know if the artists, but again, they responded. Mm. What I need, what I'm asking the artists is actually to respond. Yes. To respond yes. to a word. To re so it's quite wide, you know, and mm. I think artists, even those who were very reticent at the start, they got into the habit of doing it, you know, yeah. the way. So I always get fantastic responses, you know. And looking to the future, do you have any thematic, special thematic uh, shows lined up or is that a big secret? Yeah, I have a few, but I'm kind of reluctant to talk about it. There's one, there's one I can talk about because I had the idea many, many years ago. I'm absolutely fascinated by what you call in Ireland altarpieces or triptychs, you know, the relig religious paintings on wood panels. Oh, okay. And I have this idea of commissioning somebody to make triptychs of different sizes, different woods, and ask my artist to paint them inside and out, you know, like a secret garden. But an artist did that a few years ago. Oh gosh, I still want to do it because I think it would be absolutely fantastic, you know. Yeah. Um, I've learned over the years that the, the most successful exhibitions that I've curated had something to do on the personal level. Mm. Uh, you know, what is personal is universal. So look at your own experience. So I'm actually working on that. I was I, I underwent surgery last week, last year, which was pretty drastic. And I'm, you know, I have some X-rays that mm. I'm actually exploring at the moment. And I've suggest I've su submitted that to a couple of the artists who also have medical records. So there might be an exhibition about that. Different things, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Some years ago, I participated in, in, a sh in, in a talk and there was a, a curator who was being interviewed by somebody else and he was talking about how cryptic some uh, thematic art exhibitions can be and how easy it is to lose the public, you know, when the, the theme is so cryptic and the responses are so cryptic. And he said something that shocked me, he said, how, how powerful that would that be if I was to curate an art exhibition on football? And I was thinking to myself, well, why don't you do it? Uh, you know, if you think it's going to be powerful and you're going to get a huge response from the public. Do, do football fans so I'm actually, buy out? <laughs> well, you know, yeah. um, so I'm actually working on a very famous Irish sport. I'm not going to say which one, but I need, 
I need, I need a good, again, I need many reasons for doing things. I tend to look at anniversaries. I'm, into, I'm big into commemoration. Some of my artists are really into commemorating things, you know? So again, this idea that I need another reason. So I'm looking at some anniversary. Sports in Ireland are deeply linked to the political world, yep. to the drink industry. So I'm already thinking along those lines without saying too much. Mm. So I constantly have themes in my mind, but again, it's all going to be about the artists. You know, yes. I need to see that there's convergence between sure. my idea and what my artist. I'm, I, I would never force a theme mm. on the artist. You know, so I always look at their work first. And I suppose when you, when you, the reason for doing a thematic thing, presumably, is to engage potential audience and potential collectors, rather than saying this is our summer show, this is our winter show. You yes, know, pink, I know. Pink is my color. Is sort of there's a question mark. What does he mean by that? Do you know? The actually the main reason why I do thematic art exhibitions is precisely because I represent a very uh, eclectic group of mm. artists. So how do I? How can I have you know a group exhibition featuring you know plant portraiture and abstract and semi-abstract mm. humor? And you know by finding a theme, uh, you know uh, it's one way of doing it. And you know, we live. I live in a country, Ireland, you know, where the public is not necessarily into visual art as a first preoccupation. By adding layers uh, to an exhibition like a theme, I think it's it's going to create maybe more interest. Yes. So it's a very conscientious thing okay. that I do. You know, okay. I love doing thematic art exhibitions, but there's a reason behind mm -hmm. them as well. Is there anything else you'd like to say about the actual exhibition before we, we wrap up and look around? It's an interesting thing because initially when I was thinking of the coloured pink, I was, we, we, had, we have just finished another exhibition, uh, What Do We Want, you know, on, on the theme of war or peace, you know. Um, and I wanted to have a more light sort of hearted exhibition, but then, you know, um, that's what I like about thematic art exhibitions. You just don't know what the artists are, are going to come up with, you know. Mm. and. If I look at this work by, by Owen McLaughlin, um, you know, uh, Sumud. I, had to, I, I studied Arabic in college, but it's a bit rusty now. I had to look up, look up the, the spelling of it, and you know, it, it, it means um, 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 steadfastness okay. or perseverance, you know, and it's, it's a term that is used a lot in the context of the um, Palestinian cause, you know. So, it's an exhibition with the color, you know, about the color pink, but there are serious uh, yeah. uh, subjects being uh, illustrated, you know. And I decided to place it beside uh, David's work. Uh, there's something quite nocturnal uh, about the two of them, and I think there's a narrative about David's work. You don't, you don't really know what this, what, what is happening there with this abandoned bus. Again, I always try to. Um, and works that might create dialogues, you know, that people will find maybe a narrative, you know. Yes. So uh, the idea of the amount of spend, time that one spends in hanging works, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, this idea that, you know, there's two narratives here and is there commonality between the two, you sure. know, and you're trying to really make yeah. a show, you know. I mean, that area there, which is beautiful, it's so peaceful and the idea of protection in, in the work of, of Hugh, you know, uh, the title is Safe, you know, yes. and I was wondering, you know, uh, what is Hugh trying to say, what is he saying there? Um, you know, and beside, you know, um, Nikki is really peaceful and, you know, these works are quiet. Uh, there's absolutely no way I would have put them beside, you know, the mm, more, you know, way. so you yeah, have to yeah. think about those. Actually, you know, we're talking about shocking pink, you know, I don't know if you know about shock, shocking pink, it's a pink, again, that's when I was reading about the pink color. It's a, it's a shade of pink that the uh, Elsa Schiaparelli, she was Coco Chanel's most, um, um, she was her competitor, really, and she came up with that with that shade of pink. You know, the film Men Prefer Blondes with Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe wears a shocking pink, and her dress is shocking pink, you know, and I was thinking, it'd be great if one of the artists, you know, was to produce a painting with shocking pink, you know, and I think Owens was the closest to it, you know, in a way. Yes. And then, you know, uh, Sheila, I only got that piece on Friday, last Friday, you know, yeah. so, um, and they had to be together as well. But again, it's a very vibrant pink, yeah. so there's absolutely no way I would have placed with these, so you have to take that into, Gosh, yeah. I only have one room here. Some galleries yes. have two, three rooms, so it's easier yeah. to actually set, I, you know, I need to think about that, you know, that okay. corner there, which I think is more maybe playful, uh, by the way, I always place, um, 
uh, Kelly Ratchford's work uh, close to Mary's work. For whatever reason, they, they always go well together. I can't explain that, you know, but I, and this is an area that you don't, you don't actually see as, as you walk into the space. No. So it's a bit of a surprise as well. You play with your space and when you only have one room, you need to be careful about that. Very good. This, that's been very interesting. I've enjoyed it. And also, it's certainly cleared up my mind as to what curation actually is and what it's not. Mm. Um, I'm sure you'd agree. So on that point, could we go to the audience and maybe ask you if you have any questions uh, for Olivier? I think we have a question here. Uh, I'm sorry. guilty that we didn't have at least one question. Oh, yes. Thank you. Is, uh, what, what interesting sequelae followed any of your themed exhibition? Did something happen that surprised you as a result of the theme? Yes, the one about climate change. Um, and you know about that one. You participated in some panel talks. I'm very pleased to see that that's 2017. People are still talking about it. Uh, a professor in Maynooth University used the actual content of the exhibition in a big talk, and that to me, and there's so many exhibitions about climate change, you know, and I certainly wasn't the first one to do one, you know. Even though at the time some people thought it was the best thing since slicing bread, I was like, actually, you know, climate change has been talked about or represented by artists for a long, long time, and people don't necessarily re realize that. I think Barry Cook was already at it, but that Kylie, you know, uh, has been covering it through her work on floods, for instance, you know. But for whatever reason, the exhibition that we had here on climate change, uh, people still talk about it. And a few years ago, um, one of the departments of, of the, the government published um, a list of all exhibitions on climate change. And I went through the lists and I was there. And luckily enough, because it's two degrees Celsius, we're at the top of the list. But what I realized is that there were lots of exhibitions about climate change being listed, but I was the only commercial gallery who had done a show on climate change as such. And I think maybe that's the specificity about my gallery that, uh, you know, I, I sort of instigate themes that maybe other commercial galleries might not. Through, I'm talking about group shows here, you know. So, um, so yeah, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question there, but uh, yeah. Anybody else? Yes. I think the exhibition that we did with Fighting Words was also really ah, interesting. Ah, yes. Yeah, I don't know if you want to mention that. Yeah, hopscotch. So again, I the, the year was 2015, and again, talk about the personal. Um, I was thinking about childhood memories a lot um, because I was going to turn, I think, 40 or 50 the following year. Anyway, uh, it was on my mind. I'm sure getting, it was 30. <laughs> getting old, you know, and so I was thinking about that, you know, and I thought, well, it would be great, you know, to do an exhibition on childhood memories and children's games, you know. I said, again, I need a reason to do that. What reason can I have? And I started looking at commemorations, you know, uh, a year, the year was 2015. What happened that it was the 150th anniversary of the publication of Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. So one. Then the show I wanted to present it, that view was going to be November. November is Universal Children's Day or something yes, like yeah. that. So I thought two reasons, you know, and my own reason for doing it. So I asked the artist to work on that idea. And then somebody had mentioned the work of an institution that is not too far away from here, Fighting Words. It's a center that helps kids who have certain talents, writing talents, to develop their skills. And I was thinking, wow, wouldn't it be brilliant to get the kids to respond to the works? Uh, the thing was, the, the artists had just commenced working on the works. I had no final work, you know. So I asked all the artists to uh, give me images of their work in progress, and I just produced a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation. And I went to, um, obviously I told Fighting Words in advance, and they liked the idea. And I went to the center, sorry, and, and presented the, you know, the, the actual presentation on the screen, you know, explaining this is where my artists are at at the moment. And the kids looked at the presentation, and at the end of it, each selected the work that they wanted to write about. And then I was quite shocked about that. The kids were put in a room. I don't think they loved the room, but the kids had two hours to basically produce either a poem or a text. Uh, but I was told this was something that they were doing every Saturday anyway. 
and it was just magical, the results. I remember you, Kelly, were so impressed with mm. the response that you changed the title of your work to the title of the text, but this, and they, mm. they were all very young. They were basically aged people. They got it. I was, I was amazed that, mm. that the boy that was looking at mine, he got it. Mm. Without, without me being articulating about it at all, I hadn't, there was nothing there, but he got it. It was really exciting. Yeah, yeah. and, yeah, and, 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 nice and collaboration. And the parents' pride, because when we presented the show, as you, usually you don't put text beside, you know, a work. It's just a bit distracting, you know. I thought, oh, we have to do that. So we actually printed um, the text uh, and we presented, you know, the work of art and the text beside it. Mm. I think it was the parents that were so moved, more than the kids, you know. Obviously the kids were very happy, but the parents were just like, you know. And then the show came to, to the gallery, you know, and yeah, yeah. fantastic. And again, in, in Fighting Words, they still talk about that, you know, that was for them a great uh, experience right. as well. Yeah. We have another question. Sorry, I come to you, okay. right. Just to follow up on your um, referencing uh, thematic exhibitions, um, what about seven years ago? This being Bloom's Week, and you had the uh, there's a bit of the artist about Paul Bloom, and the staging of that, and the way it was set up, that you had a 48 hour, 24 hour sketching situation, and then the artist had to come back and present a finished work. Hmm, I have to remember. Oh yes, sorry, that's a long time ago now, but I remember. Uh, it was a collaboration with, I think, Dublin Sketchers, um, um, whereby, and some of my artists, and we base, Dublin Sketchers meet every Sunday and they go sketching, they go about sketching in the city centre in Dublin, and um, um, we got them to respond to different chapters of, of Ulysses, and is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, just and just being sweet, it was really interesting, you know, challenging for me because I was going to uh, feature work by non-professional artists. But what we did, though, I don't know if it's the same exhibition, uh, we actually uh, cho chose people who had to sketch for a professional reason. So some of the artists were either designers or different professions. But in a nutshell, we then sort of exhibited the result of those sketching sessions here in the gallery. So, and since then, actually, the collaboration with Dublin Sketches continues. And they were here two weeks ago. Um, and they sketched the then exhibition that we have and they produce sketches and I publish them online. So it's great to strike those collaborations, mm -hmm. you know, when you do a thematic art exhibitions because they bring different layers. Sure. And then those collaborations stay, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, who knows? Yeah. Like the garden we planted outside with Beverage College, you know, I thought that was good, just going to be for the exhibition of Urban Trees and, you know, a year later, the art teacher of Belvedere College, you know, wants the kids to document the progression of the garden. Oh, yeah. Things like that, you know, very so, uh, yeah. Very good. Yeah. I have an idea, when you were talking about the children, the writing group, and um, the last couple of months, there was a, a GoFundMe for a dance people from the inner city. There was a wonderful mother and now the daughter, and she teaches uh, the children dance, and they actually were invited to partake in some place in, I don't know, it was Budapest or God. Mm. And I mean, it was just fantastic. And I mean, the children, they bring 20 euros, but if they haven't got it, it doesn't matter. But something, I mean, I mean now they're off to this international dance festival. And I just think it would be something of a theme mm. too, with the dancers. Mm. Yes. It's just an idea. Yes. yes, actually, we had an exhibition by Owen McLaughlin some years ago, There Are Four about the plight of the Irish forest and Owen built a gigantic, I don't know if some of you might have seen it, gigantic uh, forest made of sheets cups. of paper. Not cups, no? No, that's no, no. that different exhibition. Okay. And, <laughs> and, um, and a dancer came to see, a professional dancer came to see uh, the exhibition and uh, she wanted to respond to it, but there was no time for her. But that really, I thought, oh my God, to get performance art, you know, as a, so that's another uh, exploration path for me. But yeah, your idea is, yeah, there's so many ideas that can be explored, you know, and I've had so many ideas over the years, some of them haven't mm. materialized for whatever reason, but uh, yeah. We have a question from Mary Pavlides in the back. I just, I just think that Mary Fitzgerald talked to us about her painting there. 
Mary Fitzgerald. Yes. Would you have a word? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's putting in the spot. <laughs> These two paintings are the biggest I've ever made in, in my career to date. Um, I usually walk 30 by 40, so I want to scale up. So the the impetus to scale up has, has dominated the walk over the last um, year. But the, the way I make walk, I think, is in which to describe it's very intuitive, very of the hands, and decisions are made in the studio. I walk on up to 40 paintings at one time, and they all have different walls. They have the like first division, second division, third division walls, and they move around and they inform each other. And the decisions to put a mark here or put a mark there, I can't explain them really, but they, they happen because I know it's meant to go there. I'm instructed each, each decision made. But I walk with pink because I, I find pink an extraordinary colour. It's fresh and clean and very challenging. Whatever you put beside it is difficult and a difficult decision, and yet it sings all the time. And this became cave dwellers because, in the process of making walk, a form or a recognisable, tangible thing to me was the marriage. And I was thinking about the cave dwellers in the Spanish. There was a documentary or something, and things flash into my head, and I catch on to them. And there's a sort of sort of space there that I would consider. And I like the idea of a cave and hiding or recluse or and that I make you feel protection place to be still. And with all of the world at the moment it was a place maybe to retreat. But mm -hmm. I do find colour the most sumptuous thing to walk with mm -hmm. as a painter. And bring Does that help? <laughs> Any other artists wants to talk about their work? <laughs> we have a few artists here in the room. Hi, uh... I was just thinking like, um, initially when you brought up the theme of pink, I thought, gosh, it's not really something um, I could visualize because there are so many connotations and so many different shades of pink. And I suppose in the art world, it's not regarded as a true color because it's a mix of starkly, it's a mix of red and white. Um, but then when I thought about it, the <clears throat> most common association that everybody would think of in terms of pink would be pink for a girl and blue for a boy. And then I was interested to read that, again historically, it was actually the other way around, mm -hmm. that pink was for a boy and blue was for a girl, um, which brought me to the idea of gender. And then because gender has become such a big issue in society now, um, I thought it would be interesting to explore ideas of gender. Um, but then at the end of the day, the whole gender thing came down to people just being human. So I decided to um, explore the nature of pink as a human colour. And the initial watercolours led me to just the body um, as non-male and non-female. And then some of the images suggested, I suppose, intestines and things. So I began to think of the nature of gender as just how one feels in one's gut about whether you might be male or female. Um, and before that, gender is not really an issue I would have explored. So it was an interesting challenge to just start with the, with the color and mm. develop it. Um, so in the end, I did a series of, I think, just seven so far, but I would probably continue to work on them for a bit more. Um, so that's the one. On the that's Sheila Norton, everybody. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. So um, this is the work here. <laughs> yeah. And down at the end. Um, so that, that's basically it. So it might be interesting for people to know mm. the background. It's fascinating, the, the change. Uh, uh, I was reading about that. Absolutely <laughs> fascinating. You know, historically, I think pink was seen as a derivative, derivative of red. And if you look at school uniforms, like sports t-shirts, or at the time, they were not wearing t-shirts, but sort of uniforms, there was a lot of pink for, for boys, you know, and the change apparently came about uh, during the 1940s. Uh, I would suspect that it came about before that. You know, pink being a deriv derivative of red, in no much of time, was it seen as a weaker, as a weaker, color uh, representing a weaker part of society and it's no wonder that the nazis you know forced homosexuals to to wear the pink triangle but they did that in 1940s so that's why i think you know the uh, the the change you know uh, 
uh, of the pink color being more like feminine, uh, a sign of femininity actually is early in the 1940s. Otherwise, the Nazis wouldn't have done it. Um, but it would be interesting to, to, to research that a bit more. It's incredible the amount of research on, on, the, on, the, on the color pink, you know. So, yeah, it's actually a recent it? color name as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not seen as a, as a color. And if you look at the word in most languages, uh, it's, it's derived from a flower. Like in French, it's rose, you know. Um, in English, obviously, pinks were, were flowers as well, yes, you know. Yes, and yes. that didn't exist as a color name for a long, long time. It's so I think it's 17th century or 18th century that people started using it as a color mm. name. So it's interesting when you start looking at colors, you know, the history of colors and um, different sort of interpretation about them, you know. So. Very good. Very good. Anyone else before we wrap? No? Okay. Well, have a look at the, at the exhibition, you know. It's, uh, it's what this is all about, that, you know. So the show is running until the end of July. Um, on the 17th of June, just in case there are artists here, I'm actually going to give a talk at the Signal Arts Centre, but it would be more practical <coughs> about, you know, for people who want to curate art exhibitions, you know, the do's and the don'ts and things like that. And I'll be in conversation with the art historian, Jean Ryan, and that's on the 17th of June, Jean Ryan. Uh, and everybody's welcome. I think Signal has put that on their social media, so. So this is, an, in essence, a bit of a rehearsal for me. Yes, <laughs> good. Uh, you passed, except for your shirt. <laughs> not impressed, not impressed. <laughs> My mother would agree with you. She kept saying, this is not pink. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, thanks so much for coming. Thank you.